Okay, uh, thank you very much. Welcome to the 2022 annual meetings uh, talk series. I am Jihad Azur, I'm director of the Middle East uh, and Central Asia Department at the IMF. I would like first to welcome you, uh, despite the rainy day and the difficulty to enter the building. Uh, uh, and thank you for uh, coming to this in-person um, talk, first time uh, since the outbreak of COVID. And also, uh, it's a, not only first time as we meet, but also this is my first um, uh, governor's talk with, uh, with uh, the governor of Central Bank of Armenia, my good friend Martin. Uh, and I'm very pleased uh, that uh, he accepted our invitation to discuss a topic that is not only timely, but I think the approach that Armenia and the Central Bank in Armenia is following is one of uh, uh, those that are very interesting. We will discuss um, the risk management approach to price stability. And specifically, we will focus on the role of policy credibility. I think policy credibility is one of the main issues that central bank governors are struggling with these days. Uh, and therefore, we all look forward um, uh, to um, uh, the comments by, uh, by, uh, uh, by you, Martin. Um, um, Governor Galstein, uh, first of all, thank you for joining us. You are. Uh, one of those governors who have been innovating, uh, who have been dealing with uh, successive shocks. Uh, the COVID crisis, um, the food security shock, and recently the war in Ukraine, especially for a country that is uh, uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, and um, uh, you have uh, uh, been successfully dealing with all these shocks. Currently, you are proposing a new approach to monetary policy that recognizes um, the very uncertain and challenging environment in which central banks take policy decisions today. We would very much uh, like, first of all, if you can share with, with us your thoughts, I think you have a presentation. And then uh, I will uh, use my position to ask you a couple of questions. And I will open the floor for uh, Q&A. Uh, for those who would like to uh, ask questions to uh, 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 after the presentation, please stand up, uh, say your name, and please keep your questions brief because I'm sure there are many questions that the governor will be asked after my after his presentation and my questions. Martin, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, hope hope you can hear me well. Excellent. So, um, first of all, dear jihad, it's it's a great pleasure. Thank you all for for coming. And then, because the time is short, I'll just go through my presentation, and then later take questions from Jihad and hopefully from, from you as well. So <clears throat> the title of, of my presentation is Risk Management Approach to Price Stability and the Role of Policy Credibility. I'm going to advocate for a paradigm change in monetary policy frameworks, which shifts the focus from optimal policy based on more probable baseline scenarios to risk management approach, which instead focuses on minimizing regrets from policy errors. On my title slide, you can see this is the training and research center of the Central Bank of Armenia in a picturesque town of Dilijan, which is in Armenia. And here we are um, investing heavily in developing the new monetary policy framework. And I'm going to talk about it now. So uh, the idea started with people on the slide, uh, most notably David Archer from BIS, whose ideas in the beginning, I have to admit, sound a bit strange. So jointly with Doug Luxton, probably many of you know him, um, he's now doing the Better Policy Project. The Central Bank of Armenia merged with Doug efforts and we created something which is called Global Forecasting School which currently includes people from National Bank of Georgia and Central Bank of Armenia. The vision of the GRFS is to work on the development of this new framework and invest in human capital to create global superstars. The work that I'm presenting reflects months of joint efforts. And on this slide, you can see uh, many of our people 
Uh, I want to thank them for their wonderful work. And um, we have been struggling with this idea for, for months. And then I'll try to be short in, in presentation. So um, to motivate the need for a new monetary policy framework, I want to show you the forecasting performance of several central banks. On this slide, you can see the policy rate projections of four advanced central banks, namely Sweden, Norway, Czech Republic, and New Zealand. The charts clearly show that even the advanced central banks are not very good at forecasting. Having said that, it is also quite obvious that these forecasts are especially bad in times of uncertainty, where we can see basically a mean reversion tendency in the projections. The current approach of monetary policy, and therefore the communication strategies, critically hinge on the ability of the central banks to forecast the future and design optimal policy responses. Now, this is, that is a problem, because we can clearly see that we at the central banks are not good at forecasting, for good reasons, by the way. This is the reason that the key point of the new policy framework is to treat monetary policy as a risk management exercise with multiple scenarios, rather than finding the best baseline forecast. So the main question, how to design a framework which recognizes that, first, central banks are terrible at forecasting, especially in times of uncertainty. And now I'm being self-critical. And the second is that there are no linearities in the economy, which can kick in and drag the economy towards dark corners. This is a term which was coined by Olivier Blanchard several years ago. The meaning is that there are dark corners from which we want to steer the economies away from. Because if we get there, the costs are going to increase in a nonlinear way. Deflationary spirals or overheating, which the anchors inflation expectations, are good examples. In these situations, the role of the monetary policy would not be trying to predict the most probable scenario, but really to make sure that we get the economy further from these dark corners, even if this may imply more aggressive policy decisions. So in my future slides, I'm going to make the point that situations where monetary policy has been behind the curve, including the current juncture, it is not just a bad luck, but flow in policy frameworks. So the Central Bank of Armenia working paper, which was just published, <clears throat> um, spells out the details of this new framework. In case you would like to read it, you can find it out on, on the website. You can also see here the YouTube link, which we created in Global Forecasting School with our students, explaining the ideas in more details. We also have a uh, privilege to get comments from uh, John Taylor, Mickey, Levy, and Michael Bordeaux on, on the framework that we're developing. So having talked about the importance of scenarios, it is probably worth stepping back a bit and emphasizing key ingredients of scenarios, which are relevant for our monetary policy. We think that any good forecasting and policy analysis system, FPAS in short, has to have three ingredients. First ingredient, we call it, where is the economy now? Are we in an overheating economy or in an excess capacity economy? So what are the initial conditions? That's the question number one. Second, what do we think might be driving the economy in the medium term? What are the main forces which are going to determine the dynamics of the economy going forward? And the third, and probably the most important one, how do we need to adjust our policy instruments to achieve our policy goals? I really want to emphasize the last point because it makes explicit that monetary policy must be proactive and clearly signal the markets that it is ready to deliver on its price stability objectives. In other words, the central bank is ready to adjust its instruments as much as needed to achieve its price stability objective. Currently in FPAS Mark I, I would say, Many central banks use baseline scenarios 
and those baseline scenarios have those three ingredients. So what are we adding? I'll tell you in a minute. So this slide shows the big picture of evolution of monetary policy frameworks, starting from non-FPAS frameworks with passive role for monetary policy going to FPAS Mark I and then FPAS Mark II. On the horizontal axis, we have put the main criteria we think are useful when thinking about monetary policy frameworks. This slide, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of the <coughs> evolution of monetary policy framework, when we did not have FPAS systems, there was no explicit proactive role of monetary policy acknowledged through macroeconomic projections. So macroeconomic projections did not play an integral and essential part of communication with the market and did not have three ingredients of policy scenarios that I mentioned in my previous slides. FPAS Mark I was a significant step forward. The important innovation of FPAS Mark I was the recognition of endogenous monetary policy with clear objectives and the communication with public through consistent scenarios. More specifically, it recognized the need of proactive and forward-looking monetary policy. So FPAS Mark I was a very important development, but as I mentioned before, it put too much emphasis on just one baseline scenario, failing to make into account uncertainty in a serious way, especially when there are no linearities involved. The second row represents how we deal with uncertainties. Scenario analysis is the main tool to deal with uncertainty. You can see here that we marked both red and green for FPAS Mark I here. The reason is that many FPAS Mark I central banks do publish alternative scenarios. But in reality, when you look at uh, the internal <coughs> policy processes and the actual published alternative scenarios, it is quite clear that these scenarios are just marginal variation of the baseline. So psychologically, <coughs> once you call a scenario baseline, it, con uh, it concentrates all the energy and attention to that particular scenario, and alternative scenarios do not have impact on policy. In FPAS Mark II, there is no baseline scenario. The essence of FPAS Mark II is to publish several scenarios all at the same time without naming any of them baseline. This explicit acknowledgments and uh, acknowledges the uncertainty and underlies the policy actions needed to bring inflation back to target under each scenario, rather than concentrating on one mm. central scenario, pretending that we can forecast the future well. The third criterion is related to the second one, is the risk, and this is the risk management approach to monetary policy. This is so-called least regrets policy, as was coined by the Assistant Governor of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. This means that instead of trying to design an optimal policy, <clears throat> we're trying to come up with a robust policy which minimizes regrets of possible policy errors. This is completely different mindset and the uncertain time may warrant more aggressive policy response to steer the economy further from dark corners depending what is the policy maker are more afraid of. For example, currently, if one is really worried about wage price spiral and runaway inflation, one may actually choose to adjust the policy rate aggressively, even though this may not be the most probable scenario in mind. To be clear, the risk management approach is not a new idea and has been advocated in Greenspan's 2004 speech. But what we are doing is incorporating this in systematic monetary policy framework. So we're creating framework. The fourth criterion is transparency and accountability framework. The reason this is essential is that we do not design the framework right. This may look like a pure discretion because we talk about multiple scenarios and there is always an important component of judgment. The judgment, by the way, is essential both for mm. FPAS Mark I and FPAS Mark II. The idea is to design a framework which aligns board members' decisions with their own reputation. So we basically put board members on the line working with markets as well. This means that the board will have to explain to the market constituency mm. and constantly of 
the repetition and the ideas behind scenarios. For example, right now, if we look at the Fed's dot plots and quarterly economic projections, it is very hard to square the dots and the very marginal increase of unemployment that is needed to bring inflation back to the target. So there is a mis mismatch there to our understanding. It does not mean that these scenarios are not possible, but it rather means that they warrant some transparent communication behind these projections. Again, to illustrate the evolution of frameworks that I mentioned before, I want to make sure the importance of endogenous and forward-looking monetary policy mm -hmm. is clear now. The graph on this slide is the excerpt from Bank of England's inflation report. It shows that what would happen to inflation if interest rates were constant at 1%. Notably in this graph, inflation goes back to target even if monetary policy does not do anything which is in stark contrast with the three ingredients I was talking about. We think that markets would get much more information if they saw what policy instruments and adjustments would be needed to bring inflation back to target. This is why we emphasize important step towards FPAS. Again, continuing on evolution, <clears throat> FPART uh, Mark I was a very significant innovation but we think there is a significant room for improvement. First, it puts all the eggs into one basket, which is the baseline scenario. In this framework, the credibility of the central banks critically depends on the accuracy of their expert knowledge and forecast. So when forecast turns out to be wrong, central banks are having a hard time explaining to the public why they should continue trusting banks. As Larry Summers called it, the folly in baseline destroys credibility. Of course, the last two years illustrate this point very clearly. In case of Federal Reserve, the baseline of transitory inflation put the Fed in a very difficult position because over time it became very difficult to recognize that inflation is staying persistently high without losing credibility. Second important problem is the local linear approximations and the failure to recognize the existence of nonlinearities. As the picture on the right hand side shows, linear approximations work until they don't. If we assume that, we, that the world is linear, we may drive into the woods. Credibility of the central banks is one such example. Because if we assume that central bank's credibility is exogenous, like many people did after great moderation, we may underestimate the dark corners and the cost of our policy errors. I will illustrate scenarios showing this. So this is F Park Mark, Mark II. What is the practical <clears throat> proposal? So we suggest here, instead of pretending that we can predict the future, which I showed that we cannot, to publish the, and communicate with the market several mm -hmm. scenarios. More specifically, we always publish, in our case, at least two. For example, case one scenario, in this case, mm -hmm. where the interest rate goes higher than the market expectations to bring inflation back to target, we call it hawkish scenario, and the case B, a dovish scenario, with policy rate path, which is lower than the market expectations. So central banks, would describe these two scenarios in a consistent way, showing to the market that they are considering more than one scenario and delivering the fundamental message that they don't know the future, but in any of these cases, they are prepared to adjust the instruments to achieve price stability. Probably that's the main message that I'd like to convey. <coughs> this will significantly reduce the taper tantrum situations and decrease the policy inertia because markets will be prepared to see proper policy action. And the third scenario, which will be published only occasionally when needed, the case X or case Y scenario, would describe dark corner inflationary or deflationary scenario. By publishing these scenarios, central banks would send a clear message that they are prepared to adjust their instruments sufficiently aggressively to avoid these dark corners. And here we go again, this is the same thing. Let me move to slide number 14. 
To show you how would this work in real life, I would illustrate examples of the scenarios as of September 30th this year. Here you can see the expected future path of three months Fed funds rate, which is implied from the market forward rates. We will be constructing our case A and case B scenarios <clears throat> relative to this line. So <clears throat> the green line here is an illustrative scenario which starts from the output gap, gap of 0.5. You can probably, if you don't see it, it's very right corner on the top. And the core PC inflation is about 4.7%. In this scenario, Fed funds rate have to go above 4.5. This is top left hand panel to generate a slack in the economy to bring inflation back to the target. Notice that the role of monetary policy and the th three ingredients <coughs> are extremely clear here. Another important aspect is that you can see here in the middle chart the credibility of the central bank, which is endogenous and nonlinear in our own model. Unfortunately, I do not have time to go over the details, but we will be ha having a separate working paper on that. So the main point here is that credibility is a stock that is easy to lose and hard to gain. And once you lose it, the ability to bring inflation back to the target is lower because economic agents become less forward looking. So there is nonlinearity there as well. So <clears throat> case B scenario is the orange line. In this case, interest rate goes up to around 3.2%, which is lower than the market expectations because the output gap collapses in quarter three immediately. It's not going up and then collapsing, but collapsing immediately. For example, if a board member in the institution is worried about equity market correction, which can bring negative wealth effects, and hence a collapse in demand, he or she may be wanting to outline this. In this case, interest rates would need to be below market expectations, and inflation would go down to the target. Importantly, there is no need to assign explicit probabilities to these scenarios, but the board members can use language to nudge the markets if they think one of these scenarios is more probable. The value of these scenarios is to show the market with full consistency. As a result, when new data arrives, which is more in line with case A or case B, markets do not get caught by surprise. Finally, the case X scenario is a dark corner scenario. In this particular case, the underlying inflation is much higher and inflation expectations are much higher because of measurement errors. Fed funds rates have to go to 7.5% to bring inflation back to target. Fed needs to engineer a big negative output gap, a big recession to bring inflation back to target. And you can see in the middle, we really lose a lot of credibility because we lost the control of inflation just for a while. This will deliver the message to the markets that Fed is ready to do whatever it takes to bring inflation to the target. Now, I know that 7.5 may look too much. But remember that 10 months ago, 4.5 we see in the market seems too much at that time. And this is the value of communicating these scenarios. If time goes by and we see the risks of case X increasing, then the risk management approach would warrant more aggressive reaction, but the markets would have the implications in the scenarios. Interestingly, we have replicated this exercise in summer of 2021, and you can see here that case X scenario looks like case A scenario. Now, and having a risk management approach would have really helped Fed if they used this approach. Now there is an important nuance. You might think that we are forecasting the past, but the real message is that not that our models would somehow predict the future better. What we want to say is that it would be much better if Fed explicitly communicated that both persistent case A and transitory case B were plausible scenarios and show the appropriate policy responses. The way the Fed would not bet all its credibility 
on the baseline, which was transitory inflation story. And markets would be more prepared to policy actions it took after it became clear that inflation is persistent. At the end, I would like to illustrate the importance of nonlinearities using the example of endogenous credibility. This simulation shows you mm. the same green line and compares it to the case where credibility is exogenous and is fixed at the perfect level. In other words, the policymakers think that their trust does not reflect their policy results. In this case, to bring inflation back to the target, interest rate has to go up only to 3.5%, one percentage point lower than in the case of perfect credibility. This implies that the future of re recognizing important nonlinearities may have serious consequences and again underlines the risk management approach to policy. I do have this slide as well, but probably mm. I'll, I'll skip this one and then during the q and I'll be happy to, to formulate that. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to take it. Excellent, fascinating presentation. Thank you very much. Um, Martin, let me ask you um, first question on, on the approach itself. <clears throat> How would this risk management approach um, address the challenge that we face now, uh, which is already an inflation that is very high and um, over-tightening risks is growing? Do we need scenarios? Aren't we in a situation where things are clear? Uh, when So probably we need scenarios when things are not as clear as we thought during the great generation, the, the moderation period. But um, I would say that there are certain difficulties with, with introducing this approach. So we tried it in our own bank, and there are maybe three most important things that I would like to underline while moving towards this direction. One, uh, there should be a mindset shift in all layers of, of the central bank, starting from the board, when board would be ready to put themselves on the line and tell what they think and probably somehow try to help markets and nudge markets. The second is modeling and forecasting part, which is becoming a nightmare in a way because there are so many nonlinearities that you should be taking into account. And the third one is the human capital part. Mm -hmm. So in order to do this kind of work, you need really not only economists, but the guys who are understanding the entire context. So human capital development is, is one way forward. Um, are we implementing it at the Central Bank of Armenia? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Russian-Ukrainian crisis helped us to steer the process because right in March, when the conflict started, it was February 24, if I'm not mistaken, the day after, we had a board meeting. And then we should go out to the public telling them that our previous forecast, which was a baseline approach, mm -hmm. was completely wrong and off the charts. And then we thought that why shouldn't we come up with multiple scenarios and talk to the public and trying to tell them the story and the narrative that we would like to convey. And that's where we came up with these two scenarios and then we start kind of uh, nudging it into the market participants. And it helped us a lot. It helped us a lot. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of questions and then I give the floor. Um, I see that many hands are going to be raised, uh, Martin, after your presentation. <clears throat> Policy communication. This is something that uh, was one of the main instruments that central banks enjoy. And uh, usually baseline projections uh, provided by the central bank provide guidance to economic agents. Um, how do you see the risk of replacing those baseline projections with multiple scenarios? And what would be the challenge in terms of policy communication for you as central bankers? Yeah. So certainly communication remains one of the main challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I think the current transformation of this framework uh, at the beginning wouldn't make our life a bit easier even. But I think uh, while public undoubtedly or markets undoubtedly wants from us one baseline, one baseline that they can somehow use as a reference point, 
I think it would be much more honest in a way to talk to them about multitude of scenarios that could come up or out of uncertainty mm -hmm. and then communicate to them what would be the policy action to bring inflation down to the target in any of given scenarios. So markets definitely would appreciate that from our perspective. That is, again, a cultural change that would take some time. But I think both on our side and on the market side, that would be very much appreciated with the time passing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You've mentioned, uh, and um, after this question, I give the floor to the audience who would like to ask, ask, ask questions. Please get ready. You mentioned um, war in Ukraine somehow as a, as a real litmus test. Um, what could you share with us on this experience and to which extent what you have developed as scenario approach helped or did not help yep. in, in, in dealing with this shock? So I think it, it helped tremendously, and uh, I'll tell you our real-life story. So um, what we thought, so our projection for the economic growth was around 5% for the year, and then uh, when February came and the war started, I, I think our forecast went down to one6 reflecting our ties with Russian economy and our understanding that there will be some kind of a collapse of Russian economy, remittances inflow would be destructed, and so on and so forth. So that was scenario A, that we will have probably a steep decline in the GDP. But we had also board members which were trying to bring this idea to the table, which we later discussed, is that there is a possibility that Russians will start moving to Armenia. So mm -hmm. we will start think to gain a human capital, which would definitely bring our potential GDP up. It was not very plausible at the time, but because of this duality, we thought that it's a great idea to construct these two scenarios. And we didn't communicate it at that point. We did it internally. But I think that was one of, that was probably one of our mistakes that we didn't do it. Because now we see a huge influx of Russians, and then we expect 13% real growth for this year for the Armenian economy. So we do have a huge influx of IT guys to Armenia, and we see around 25% increase in human capacity in IT sector. So very well talented, framed people are moving from Russia to Armenia, which have probably very long-term consequences. So th there were two scenarios. We were not ready to communicate, uh, but uh, I think we should have do it. I have to apologize. I had to read the screen that there is no time for questions from the audience. Maybe we can take it uh, bilaterally after this, this session. Um, Martin, I had also some other questions, and I, I think I need also to line up to take them uh, on on uh, on bilateral basis. Um, thank you very much. I would very much like to uh, thank you for this uh, very interesting, thought-provoking presentation. I'm sure that I will wait uh, to see uh, uh, the other papers coming. I want to uh, also commend the work you're doing at the Central Bank with your center where you have all these brains. Um, uh, to close, I want to um, thank Governor uh, Galstian uh, for uh, taking the time and uh, sharing with us a new approach to monetary policy. Uh, and we will have the opportunity with the team to follow up on, uh, uh, on this new approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a great pleasure.